Hey, everybody. Happy holidays. I have Mike from Microgains here on the podcast. He's a longtime friend and supporter of the podcast. You all know him because you've listened to the podcast. Wanted to have him on during the holidays just to say like, hey, man, what is going on at Microgains during the holidays? What does this look like for you right now this time of year? Hey, thanks for having us again. Very busy right now. Obviously, the holidays are a huge time for us. Getting orders out on time to customers. We've added some new products and things like that to do better for you in the gym and help you make some gains. I love micro games. We've used them for years. You are the fractional plate that we use. If you sign on for Barbell Logic Online Coaching, we give links to microgames.com. You need fractional plates. You can't do everything you need to do with tens, fives, and two and a halves. You often need weights. Almost everybody's going to need weights smaller than that, at least down to 1.25. You have full sets of fractional plates for barbells. That's really how you made your name in the industry, but you've come out with a lot of new products as well. Dumbbell fractional plates. What are some other things that you have going on right now that you think might be hot sellers for the holiday season? Season. So as you mentioned, we are sort of the king of a USA made fractional plates. We actually made our fractional plate set a little better. We now offer it in multicolors. So you can get a multicolor set, which includes green quarter pounders, yellow half pounders, blue three quarter pounders, and red one pounders. So instead of the all black set, now you have this like nice color set for easy weight selection. So now you know the red ones are one pounders, I can pick up those. So we started making those. A lot of people really like that now. Can't believe we waited so long to come out with something like that. As far as the dumbbell plates go, those have been going great. It's the best way to add weight to your dumbbells. We have that patented at this point, and it's the only way to go if you want to go up by like two and a half pounds or two pounds. You know, sometimes yeah. going up to that next weight, 55 pounds is too tough, but a 52 and a half might be easier to do that sets and reps that you would like to get. Yeah, I love it. I love the look of the new colored fractional plates. You know, I've bragged about the dumbbell fractionals for a long time. I use those all the time. They are too big of a difference. Going from 50 pound dumbbells to 55 pound dumbbells is too much. For overheads, you go from 30s to 35s for curls. It's too much. I need that 32 and a half or 52 and a half or 57 and a half or whatever it is. And it just makes it so much easier to continue to make progress, linear progress even, on accessory movements, let alone just the barbell stuff. So you also started making, and I think I got one of the first sets of these, you started making fives and tens and other things that weren't just fractional plates. So you don't just have plates that are less than two and a half pounds. You now have plates that are more than two and a half pounds. That's correct. We offer two and a half, fives, and tens. Those are all made out of laser cut steel. The unique thing about those is they're super thin. Yep. So you can stack a lot on a bar. And especially if you use like loadable dumbbell handles, which is not enough room to keep stacking plates on, you can put a lot of these two and a half pounds, which are only a quarter inch thick, or the five pounders, which are only three eighths inch thick. You can fit a lot of those plates on there. It makes it nice to do those heavier loading that you want to do on your loadable dumbbells, as well as some other things. Love it, man. Always have loved micro gains. Again, you're in Pennsylvania. Everything that you have is made in America, which is super cool. I've noticed you always under promise and over deliver. So anytime I think that I'm going to get my plates in 10 days and I end up getting them in four, it's always amazing how much faster stuff ships. I don't want to make promises that you can't deliver in the middle of the holiday season, but I'm amazed at your level of customer service. You take great care in what you do. You have quit your job to do this full time. It's really amazing story. And so we love being able to support you. We appreciate the support you give Barbell Logic. Where can people go to get those fractional plates, dumbbell fractional plates, fives, tens, etc., this holiday season, either for themselves or for a friend or family member? You can head over to microgains.com. We have everything on there. Like you mentioned, we do ship fast. So anything you order like today on Monday, we will ship tomorrow very next business day. That'll go all the way through Christmas. So we get as fast as you can. We ship priority mail, which is usually two to three days. So, you know, everyone thinks like Amazon two day, three day shipping. We ship very fast too. There is no wait. There is no 10 days. We don't mess around with that because we know you want your gains. And you can go to microgains.com. We have a lot of stuff there. We have some other things too. Christmas ornaments now we're offering. They're laser cut. We have like little barbells and dumbbells. Those are cool. We offer a, a weight plate tree. We have a jack stand deadlift jack among other things, some loadable dumbbell handles as well that are solid steel. So not just fractional plates. We've expanded a lot since the last time I was on. That's awesome. I love it. And tell them about the discount code for Barbell Logic listeners. Yeah. So you can use code LOGIC to save 10% off your whole order. We offer free shipping on everything. So you're getting 10% off that top line and you can use that all the way through the holiday season. Make sure to check out the Black Friday sale that we have going on as well. That will be Black Friday weekend where you can get 15% off of orders up to hundred bucks. Awesome. And again, that's microgains.com. That's micro G-A-I-N-Z.com. Discount code LOGIC for 10% off or Black Friday weekend. You can get 15% off your entire order. Mike, thanks again for being such a friend of the podcast and good luck this holiday season. Wishing you and yours a uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year's. Thank you. See you, buddy. You're listening to Barbell Logic. The podcast where we talk about what it means to experience strength. 
how you can use simple, hard, and effective strategies in training and nutrition to improve your life. It starts with meeting you where you are right now and finding lasting solutions. Welcome to the show. Hey, welcome to the Barbell Electric Podcast. I'm Matt Reynolds. I'm here with Jordan Stanton. You guys know Jordan. He's been on the podcast several times. We just had his uh, block conference talk that was on the podcast a couple weeks ago about uh, velocity training and auto regulation. Hey, man, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So we took a bunch of questions. We've been talking about auto regulation quite a bit over the last few weeks. And we took listener questions, and we're just coming on here to kind of put a bow on this. So Nikki and I did uh, an overview of auto regulation. We talked a lot about RPE and reps in reserve and why that subjectivity is not as good as having objective measures, what objective measures, measures we can use, things like AMRAP, but obviously there's big drawbacks to that. And then, of course, we've got now with uh, the advancement in technology, we've got these velocity meters. We tend to use the rep one device. Uh, but it gives us an objective feedback for auto regulation, which is really just changing the amount of stress, often intensity, but not always intensity, uh, based on how strong you are that day or how fast you are that day or or what the, uh, I, well, I actually want to dive into a little bit about the velocity curve and ask you some questions there. But um, any, any before I get into the questions, any kind of big picture ideas about auto regulation in general? that you want the listeners to know as they kind of think through this conversation that we're going to have? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the big pieces is understanding who needs to be auto-regulated, right? And we'll get more into this, but, you know, the beginner that's really not experienced at training doesn't have a good framework in which to auto-regulate their own loads necessarily. And as you become yeah. more and more advanced, not only do you become better at it, but the need increases for said auto-regulation. I know you are an experienced train or, uh, lifter as well. And, the further you get into this, the more those days seem to be high day, low day, middle day, yes. and, it, and and being able to identify where you are in that day and what the training loads are appropriate becomes increasingly important. Yeah, that's exactly right. So actually, that leads into the first question. We can just, you've already started to answer this. So we had a question about why does autoregulation not work uh, or why isn't it, shouldn't it be used in novice LP? Uh, the question says, it seems like there could be days the internal stress is high and such adding five pounds is too much stress in the same way that it is in the intermediate or advanced lifter discussed on the podcast. So I have my thoughts, but I want to turn it over to you first. You really kind of already started here, but why is this not for somebody who's in just a basic linear progression type program where we tend to add the same amount of weight every single workout to the bar? Why would autoregulation not be appropriate for that person? Yeah, absolutely. And there's a number of reasons. And the first one I'm going to go back to is a principle that I laid out in the talk um, that I gave to the block coaches, which is there must be an assumption to use velocity that form is relatively stable. And we know with novices, they're still developing their form and their form may change on a session to session basis mm, um, yep. based on learning and based on coach feedback um, and, and, and getting used to that new form that they're developing uh, for the movement. And when form changes significantly enough, it does affect the velocity curve in that case. Yeah, that's so, good. Yeah, think about how many times I, I think about this as a coach that I've got a new client at Barbell Logic and, you know, they're, I don't know, let's say they're six weeks into LP. So they're still relatively early in LP. Nothing's really that hard yet, right? It's six weeks in, which first off, because they still haven't done the weight that they're being prescribed six weeks in, there's still an adaptation project process that's occurring even with the weight that they, you know, like they, their deadlift, let's say their deadlift is at 275 at that point for a set of five. And they could maybe do 315 for a set of five, but they've never done 275. So adaptation still occurs. But it, what's crazy to me is how often somebody will do an exercise or workout, let's again say a deadlift. And on Wednesday, it's awesome. I'm like, that was, that was perfect. I was like, that textbook, perfect deadlift, awesome, nice work. Friday, they come in and they completely changed the deadlift. They cat back, pull every rep. I'm like, where did this come from? Like, what did you, what did you do? Well, uh, an advanced lifter, you and I have lifted together enough to know, like mm -hmm. our lifts look the same. I, I, whether I'm benching the empty bar, 135, 400 pounds, they all look the same. 400 is going to move slower, but they look exactly the same. And so that neuromuscular efficiency between the heaviness of the load and the lift itself, the practice with the lift, 
how many millions of reps have we done on each of the main lifts? A novice doesn't have that. And so you're introducing, it's sort of like trying to introduce high efficiency supplements to the person who's never cleaned up their diet. <laughs> it's it's just not necessary, right? In the beginning, like in the beginning, it's just like, well, the, what's the bottom of the pyramid for whether you're wanting to gain weight or lose weight? It's calories, calories in, calories out, and then macronutrients, and then start working. Well, velocity is like this for advanced lifters. It's It can be super important. Or auto-regulation or appropriate auto-regulation is appropriate for advanced lifters, but it's just, it's, it's overkill and unnecessary when, I, my argument would be for a, for a novice that whether they're having a good day, bad day, low stress, high stress, internal stress, wife stress, uh, didn't sleep last night stress, they can still put five pounds on the bar and still do the thing. And if that's the case, you don't need auto regulation. Absolutely. And and that novice should experience what it's like to come into a day where you don't feel as good as another that, day. That's right. Right. They need to know what that feels like, too. Um, otherwise, how are they going to have that for the future when they go to auto regulate their own loads unless they've experienced the full spectrum of what training has to bring to them? That's exactly right, which doesn't occur really until the end of LP, at which point we could certainly argue at that point that that person is maybe not a novice anymore. Or maybe they're an early, inter early, early intermediate, but there's still sort of a dues that has to be paid with the heavy gut busting sets that occur at the end of LP and being like, man, I barely got through my three sets of five and I come back two days later or three days later and do it all over again, but go up a little bit like that's yep. those are dues that must be paid. And so, OK, great. So so not necessary for novice uh, question here. Is there a difference between reps in reserve and RPE or is it mostly just different terms for the same thing? Sure. And I'm sure you've discussed this a little bit this week, but um, they are easily relatable to one another. But I guess technically not exactly the same thing, right? So it's mostly in the words, but RPE 8 of 10 is like an 8 out of 10 effort, uh, where the equivalent RAR reps in reserve was a 2. You had 2 more reps. So Correct. They're similar, yes. Yeah. And you could say an RPE 8 and an RAR 2 are roughly equivalent to one another. But depending on how the person um, subjectively understands those, that you could get a slightly different output from an athlete yep. or a slightly better understanding of how to regulate. I actually didn't used to use reps in reserve and I'm using them more and more in <clears throat> of a reps in reserve because it just seems a little bit easier to explain to people like do this until there's three reps in reserve and they do the best they can. And, and again, the, the earlier or less mature lifter screws that up more times that, you know, like you say three reps in reserve and then you look at it and you're like, that was five reps in reserve or six, or sometimes the opposite. You're like, that was, you didn't have any more reps <laughs> left. Right. Uh, but the same argument is going to come with RPE. And, and because I don't tend to program that way, if I do, it's almost always with accessory exercises. They're real to me. Once if you tighten up the communication and use them as a communication tool, they are effectively the same thing. It's just what how you're communicating. Right. So you've got guys like to share have used RPE for years. The Renaissance guys, bodybuilders tend to use reps and reserve. And reps and reserve makes a little more sense as well when you're doing higher reps, right? So you're doing sets of eight or 10 or 12. And you're like, well, I was down to, you know, I'm, I'm going to do a set of leg press to two reps and reserve, three reps and reserve, and you knock out 14. And you're like, okay, you know, like you just don't, <laughs> that's a little harder, right? To yep. kind of figure out. So, uh, so mostly that's the same thing. And, and those, again, are both are subjective first by the lifter in real time and, and, for an online coach and an, an online coach can give feedback on that afterwards. But again, they're both subjective, which for me, and I think you as well, to me makes them uh, less effective than something like a, a, a objective velocity meter measuring the velocity of the bar. Absolutely correct. And I would probably utilize them just like you on work or exercises that we might deem a little less important, like secondaries and tertiary yeah. type stuff. Yeah, I'll do this a lot of times. I'll do kind of AMRAPs or reps in reserve especially for the last set of accessory lifts. So maybe I've got somebody doing barbell curls with 90 pounds. I say, you're going to do 90 for a set of eight or 90 for two sets of eight. And on the third set, you're going to go AMRAP, leave two reps in the tank. Right. And then I, it actually kind of helps me understand and I can watch or see how much I should change it for the next session. So if they go eight, eight, six, I'm like, okay, we'll just keep the weight the same. And now you got to go eight, eight, seven. But if they go eight, eight, 14, <laughs> so like okay well then i need to bump the weight up next time mm -hmm. right so that's that's where it works okay for from even a programming perspective but i would never do that on squats or something i, right. I don't think i've ever programmed on the last set amrap your squat <laughs> and just go it seems like a 
a hideous thing to do to your client. So that would be pretty uh, awful. <laughs> it is pretty bad. <laughs> so one interesting question I got, this is actually a really good question, I think. Um, and it also still shows that the some of the listeners aren't fully getting it yet, is that the question is auto regulation uh, is just adjusting the atten- intensity, correct? It doesn't change the reps, sets, and percentages of one rep max. So you still need a program based on percentage of one rep max, correct? Auto regulation only changes intensity. Is that correct or not correct? There's a couple of ways to use velocity. And the ways in which I have described velocity is setting a estimated one rep max for the day. Yep. And basing the rest of the sets off of that. So when I typically program it, it will look like this rep or this many reps, this many sets at this percentage. And then I'll often give a velocity to help uh, dial you in. So it, yep. it looks very much the same on paper. And yep. velocity becomes the Rosetta Stone that tells you this is your capacity for the given day and therefore how to base the intensity from there what the actual numbers are uh, that's going to be on the bar okay now, so let me di- it, yeah go ahead, go ahead please go ahead well, I, was oh, I, was say, gonna... I want to <laughs> i want to nerd out for a second let's nerd yes. let's nerd for a second so first okay. off for velocity based training i would i would agree and even for most auto regulatory work Usually what you're doing is you're auto-regulating the intensity, the bar, the the weight on the bar up or down. But that's not always the, you don't have to do that, right? So there is a program I talked about, the APRE. It's the Auto-Regulatory Progressive Resistance ex, uh, Exercise, which was really um, uh, tweaked into a, a pretty good program by a buddy of mine named Brian Mann, who's a, who is a strength coach now down at the University of Miami. He used to be at at, um, at Mizzou. And, and originally this was talked about by Mel Sif, I think in super training. And basically what it does is it utilizes AMRAP sets to set the, the weight or the reps of the, of the back off set. So you might do <clears throat> for the APRE, let's say, so there's like a three rep routine and a six rep routine and a t- 10 rep routine. Let's say we're going to do the 10 rep routine. So you're going to, you're going to do your early warm ups, Then you're going to do 10 reps at 50% of your 10 rep max. So e- easy. Yep. Then you're going to do 10 reps at 75% of your 10 rep max. And then you're going to do reps to failure at your 10 rep max. Okay. Which means you should get 10, but some days you get seven or eight, and sometimes you get 12. True. And then you do a follow up set, a fourth set, and sometimes even a fifth set work set, where based on how many reps you got on that AMRAP set, tells you whether the weight goes up or down based on how many, and then you basically continue to do those reps to failure. The downside of that is, is that every single workout, you're doing a legit <laughs> bone on bone grinder, RP 10 AMRAP set with heavy, heavy barbell loads with squats and deadlifts and bench press and press and rows and those big kind of things. And so certainly that, but here's my other, here's my other argument that I haven't done this yet. I don't know if you have either, but you certainly could. The rep one device, these velocity devices, not only do they measure peak velocity output and average velocity, but they they measure decay. So you could actually program the decay of velocity over time. So like when you hit a rep of X, you stop. Now that would probably require a second person to sit there and watch the Mm -hmm. computer at the time to watch the little device. But if you're like, okay, we're looking for the first rep is going to be at 0.4 meters per second. When you hit 0.25 meters per second, the set is over. And that then could change, auto-regulate, not just the intensity. The intensity would be set, but would actually auto-regulate the number of reps and therefore the tonnage. And, and could, so, so it is possible, though, I would, I would agree that it's used less than auto-regulating intensity. Yeah, and I know some of our other coaches have played around with it a little bit. Um, you talked about within a set. So, you know, rep one versus two versus three and that decay. And there, the downside of that is that either the lifter has to be paying attention to that or someone, a coach has to be paying attention to that and telling them when to stop. And for me, that's getting a little too complicated. If my lifters in a set, I really just want them to be focused on what they're doing and pushing really hard. Sure. So it has some merit, but there, there's some downsides to that, right? Um, one of the other ways I've utilized it is actually to set the number of sets. So perform a set, and when the last rep or any of the reps in that set decay below a certain amount, then we call it no further sets. So for example, yes. we program one to five heavy doubles. And when velocity goes below 0.2 meters per second, abort, we're done. And right. some weeks you'll get one, and some weeks you'll get five. And by how many 
uh, sets you perform tells us sort of how much weight to put on the bar next time. Yeah, that's good. That's that's actually really interesting. So the general answer is, is that, yes, autoregulation does tend to adjust intensity more often than not. Yes. But it doesn't have to adjust intensity. It can adjust volume, frequency, number of sets, number of reps. Any of those things can be adjusted via autoregulation. Um, I definitely, this was the one question where I'm, we, we obviously communicated something wrong. Someone asked, <laughs> who goes for a one rep max every workout? That's yeah. insane. How would you adjust the back off work sets after such a rough first set? The answer right. is no one does that, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't, like, we don't do that. Not a one rep max. Now, there are times we, and maybe we've talked about this before, we work up to a heavy single and then back off sets and you use the heavy single, you work up to a single at this velocity, which is usually a single in the seven to eight, eight and a half, sometimes nine RPE range. And again, I'm using that really more as a communication tool, but I've never programmed somebody to work up to a one rep max every single workout and then do back offs based on the one rep max. And maybe what they're seeing there is when you're doing your velocity, once your velocity curve is set, and again, I wanna get into velocity curves a little bit, every day it will tell you what an estimated, what your estimated one rep max is for the day. It doesn't mean that you're working there. So, you know, I've got, Brett McKay's doing this. And it's like his estimated one rep max on deadlift today is 623. Like, well, that's, that's a great day for him. He's like, coach, my estimated one rep max was this. He would never tell anybody if they're right. like, what is your <laughs> max deadlift? 623. His, his max deadlift is actually 615. So it's not that far off. But I mean, it would be very rare that he would be able to pull something like that. But he knows that that means he's a little faster today. He can push a little harder today. Mm -hmm. When you look at those, that estimated one rep max and it's higher than it usually is. Is that mm -hmm. how you use it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, going back just a little bit, though. So the, the one rep max, right? You clarified. Yeah, we're not doing that with velocity. Um, but I'm sure you're familiar with um, Bulgarian method, right? And sure. Uh, and squat every day and a few of those others that come out that like, yeah, you work up to a heavy single and then we back everything off. And as you said, heavy single. And, and what does that heavy single uh, really mean? Well, it could be a one RM, right? You could yeah. work up to a one RM, but that's a really taxing event. But let's say we work up to a 1RM that's like um, RP9, okay? So yep. now we're blending forms of autoregulation. Well, we know auto um, RP9 or reps in reserve 1 equates to somewhere around 94%, right? right? So that could be used then to estimate what a true 1RM for the day is. And from there, we set back offset. So a 10% reduction, right? So you're going to do squat single at an RP9, and then you're going to do a 10% reduction for triples. And the 10% reduction in the end isn't super important. We set it first. We see how the athlete responds. If they respond well, perfect. 10% was right for them. Um, it's about getting the work in at that point. Yeah. And it's interrelatedness. Yep of the the values as opposed to the strict accuracy of them that's right we that's don't right. always have to be perfect in estimating a one rm we just have to be really good at knowing if this is a one then this is a three and this is a five and everything and how they interrelate with one another to get the athlete working uh, at the right amounts yeah so so now i'll ask that follow-up question yes. about the velocity curve because it's a good spot to put it in the first thing you do when you have an athlete who's an advanced lifter, they are neuromuscularly efficient. They've got very efficient movement patterns on the lifts. The first thing we do is we set their velocity curve. So the curve of their velocity, they started about 50%. They hit it for a single and 55% for a single and 60% for a single and 65, all the way up to basically 100%. Go And we try to get 10 data points somewhere in that ballpark, right? 10 mm -hmm. data points. That velocity curve, even when they're stronger or weaker, the curve you found stays basically the same, right? And that's an absolute key to this working, right? Is that it doesn't change on the, uh, the athlete's ability. Even as they grow, the curve stays roughly the same. Yeah, so we know that when an athlete hits an 85% and that 85 for the day, that 85% mm -hmm. is higher or lower than what their all-time 85% is. You can just adjust the curve. If you're thinking about looking at it on a graph, the mm -hmm. curve just adjusts up or down, but the curve, it, the slope of the line itself stays the same, right? That's that's the key. And that's what allows us to do those back offsets and say, well, now we're getting the right amount of stress for where they were at during the day. So what we're really trying to do is in these early sets, often just the first set, the first early work set, and sometimes the first few sets, we're just really trying to establish like what is the ability of the lifter for that day? And then, like you said, once we kind of have a pretty good idea, like, okay, they're having a, a normal day, 
or a fast day, a better day than normal, or a slower day than normal, then we adjust the rest of the work for the rest of the day. And then we really don't worry about velocity too much after that. We're just like, what we're really doing is we're just kind of seeing where you're at. Okay, you are you are 93% of your best self today, or you're 103% of your best self today, and you adjust the weight and therefore the work and therefore the tonnage and therefore the stress accordingly to make sure that really what you're doing is you're, you're, you're trying to dose the stress correctly to nail the stress recovery adaptation cycle. Because if the stress is too much, it can drive them into the ground and they don't recover by the next session. But if it's too little, they can detrain or, or not get any better. And so really, that's what we're trying to do. That's what ultimately this auto auto regulation does and with a velocity meter gives us an objective point of view that lets us make sure that we can hone in on the correct stress levels for that day and every day. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's to meet the athlete where they are at that given day. And that day, if it's moving and shifting, then they're going to work at a different or different um, number. And that will be appropriate in, in that moment. Yeah, perfect. OK, uh, so what guidance do you give your clients who have that super awesome day? So they start to lift and they can see that their estimated one rep max is significantly higher than what it normally is, maybe than what their actual one rep max is. Right. Mm -hmm. What scenarios, what types of clients would you have or what scenarios would have to be in place for you to say, go for it? Yeah, and absolutely. If, what, like, how do you address those? Like, do you give them some of that leeway, some of that flex? Like, hey, if you're on, it's do it. It's, it's there yep. for the taking. Yep. So you and I both know that um, those magical days that don't happen all the time. And right. that sometimes if we don't try to take advantage of them, then we, we regret them in the future because we know, oh, that day I had that lift. And then that opportunity may not come back again for quite a while. Um, so I know that. And with my more experienced athletes, I absolutely give them leeway. If they have a day and the velocity says you are significantly above your usual ability, I will tell them to go for it. And I will tell them to go for it with just a degree of caution. And that caution is, let's do an example. So their PR is 500. Okay. And the velocity says 560 today. So we're talking a pretty substantial um, yeah. increase, like 10% more than what they'd normally be able to do a little more than that. Um, I would tell them to go halfway between their PR and what the velocity says. So right. on that day, 530. Yeah, because they probably will be successful at 530. If as long as our data is accurate, it's usually pretty close. Um, but they have never experienced what it is like to squat 530, and they've certainly never experienced what it's like to squat 560. And as you know, as that load increases, new surprises begin to develop, <laughs> yeah. and the way the movement feels absolutely changes. I know the first time I, I, I squatted 700, and I felt the bar literally push through my back and touch a bone on my vertebrae and was like, oh, yeah, that's really uncomfortable. I've never felt that yeah. before. Yeah. Like, there's pleasant surprises as you keep increasing in the weight and um, just jumping right to what it says they could do is possibly going to set them up Not for failure. Idea. Yeah. But somewhere More in injury. between, somewhere yeah. in between, if that number that's in between is inviting enough to them, excites them enough, 100% go for it. Sure. Enjoy it. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. I, I can remember the same thing. I can remember the first time I, I, I actually squatted 700 as well at a meet. What was interesting to me was not the feel difference. It was what I heard and what I saw. It was actually the, some of the other senses, right? Mm -hmm. I can remember the music, which was, you know, probably, you know, disturbed or something playing at the time to date myself, you know, it's 2001. <laughs> that the music dropped an octave or two the more I descended into the squat, like, you know, it's a da -da 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 boom, boom. <laughs> that's what it did. Yep. And also what I saw was different. So like I took the bar, this is in the monolith days. I took the bar out of the monolith and I could see, and I started my descent and my sight went red. And then when I got in the hole, my sight went black <laughs> and I couldn't see anything. I was blind. And then as I came up out of the hole, it went back to red and then at the top, it turned, I could see things again, although it's, you know, lots of stars. And I never experienced that in my life, you know? And so you're exactly right. It's interesting what your body, you know, I've heard, I've heard, I'm sure you've heard the same thing. Lifters, especially in, in big, um, you know, gear, powerlifting geared, with guys that have squatted 1,100, 1,200 pounds, and they talk about literally feeling their femurs bend <laughs> under the, like, no, not interested mm -hmm. in that. But, you know, like that's like, that doesn't happen with 600 pounds. Right. But things do with a thousand pounds and eleven hundred and twelve hundred. So yeah, it's definitely. So I'm this. I'm the same way. I always try to tell my guys that 
I want to, if it's there for the taking, go for it. But I still want him to be a little bit conservative on, as a matter of fact, I will also, this is where I, if I have a good relationship with my client online, most of them will have uh, some way to get a hold of me, my number, or my, they, sure. can, they can DM me on the, and, I'll, and they'll be like, coach, it's, I, my, I feel amazing today. Okay, we're going to take a real conservative PR first. Nice. You're going to send me the video in real time, and then I'm going to tell you if you get to go up and do one more. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we'll do that sometimes too. It tends to work nice. well. Uh, okay. So if a client expresses interest in velocity training, so we probably, we've got, actually, I've had a, just several of mine interested, oddly enough, mm -hmm. um, from this series, reach out and say, you know, hey, coach, do you think this would be great for me? If they, if you have a client that expresses interest in velocity based training, how do you go about discussing it with them and beginning that? Do you as a coach bring it up? Do you, if you have a client that would be a really good fit? And then what is that initial first, if they are a good fit? what does that look like? It tends to be a pretty good lag time to get those things in. So it's like, if somebody's, if somebody's good, a good candidate for that, I'm like, yeah, it's maybe eight weeks out before you get one of these uh, machines. Yep. And then what do those first few weeks look like of training for them? Yeah. So the first piece of that is, you know, who, who, who's a good fit and how do we express it to them? So I, as a coach, yes, I will bring it up to people that I think are a really good fit for velocity. For some reason, we need some form of advanced or really accurate auto regulation for them. And then I'll raise it to them and I will give them the, you know, I will tell them it's a little on the expensive side and there's some complexity in setting it up. But for whatever reason, you know, it's going to be a good fit for you. So who is it a good fit for, right? Real quick. So if you're high interest in it, that's already already pushing you in that direction. If it's something you're really interested in as your coach, I'm excited too. Let's go yep. play with it, right? That's super fun. Um, people that have high variability in recovery for whatever reason, whatever is going on in their life, whether it's work stress or travel or all these other things that could be, um, they would be a good candidate for it. And then um, the most common I use it with is people who have other sport demands. So I work with a bunch of jujitsu athletes now, and they're constantly sparring at various intensities and competitive calendars. And they come into sessions completely different from one session sure. to another, depending on how hard they have sparred the day before or the day of. And so I find it really useful for those and I will bring it up to those specific athletes. And and then the question is, um, how do we set them up? Right. So they got to get a device. There's a number of them on the market. We're going with the rep one right now. Um, it takes some time to get they get it. And then there's a talk. So the talk is, how are we going to get the data? And you talked a little bit on that, the sort of 10 yep. data points per lift, um, lifting it with the same equipment each time and the same technique. Um, and then we do some math. Uh, on our end. But one of the most important talks they have with them is the idea of 100% intention. Yes. That something new has to go into our training um, for this to be accurate. I guess it's not always new. I, I often discuss this with many athletes, but it has to be in this type of training. And the idea that when you move these weights and we're going to collect velocity, it has to be done super fast. It has to be right. done with 100% intention to move it with excellent form, but excellent speed as well or yep. the data will be less accurate and less useful and less reliable. Yep. Yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, at this point in my career, I don't coach a lot of uh, athletes who are doing a, a second sport. One of the things I've noticed that it's been great for is for my clients who I've had for a long time who are really strong, they're, they're just kind of tired of doing like block training or DUP and the same old, same old stuff, you know, and the novelty effect that occurs by adding intentional speed to the lifts is often excellent for them. And I, I would argue, you're right, they are fairly expensive. We're talking about 350 400 bucks and up. But that's really about the same cost as a new barbell. And so if you're like, well, the other way we can add novelty is get you a safety squat bar <laughs> or whatever, then the cost is basically the same. And so you can add one new squat or one new movement because of one barbell, a camber bar, or whatever, you can do that, or you can get this device and you can add it to all of your main lifts and add some amount of novelty and in intention in its velocity moving forward. And it, it really seems to sort of light a fire under their ass a little bit to be like, I'm, this is awesome to use. Like, and, I, and you and I have both used it personally as well. Mm -hmm. It is actually really fun. Like you're trying to beat your numbers or beat what you did last week or like, oh, I want to move this as fast as I can with perfect form because I want to actually be able to, to have my best performance. I mean, it's, it's, it's very performative on every single training session. And I, I don't know that that's always great. Cause there's probably times when you're like, you just, you know, you're really stressed and really beat up. And sometimes you just want to have those blue collar days and 
mm-hmm. and punch the time card. And I think it actually will work fine there as well. Like get that velocity set, get that stress yep. set for the day. And then, and then like you've said, just put the thing away and just lift and just finish the workout and you're, you're fine. So it, it, there are lots of people that it works great for. Um, and I, I like it for people like that. I, I would hesitate to suggest it to people who haven't paid the dues through in, in intermediate training or even into advanced, early advanced. I mean, at this point, like you should have been able, if you don't know really well what your one rep max is all time, and I'm not talking about, you know, you and I walk around, I can't hit my one rep maxes, my all time PRs right now, right? right. Yeah, I assume you can't either. Correct. And so when somebody asks me my PR, I go, well, I, you know, I've squatted this and I benched this and I pressed this and I deadlifted this, but that was, you know, four years ago and six years ago and this yeah. and whatever. <laughs> like for a lot of people, maybe it's a year ago or six months ago. And so if you if you have no idea what that answer is because you haven't done like walked through the fire of that sort of training, I would get through that training first. Like I think there is some advantages to training heavy long enough that you get yourself into triples, doubles and singles that you really get clean with heavy lifting. Just like you said, it's dip, three sets of five heavy is not the same thing as a top heavy single and mm-hmm. back offs There's something different that happens. And so. If you've gone through most of that, then I think this is a great place to go. And and again, it gives you a great objective input, b- much better than RPE and reps in reserve, m- much less stressful than AMRAPs that allow you to auto-regulate on a day-by-day basis to make sure you're getting the right stress under the bar. So it works Absolutely. Well. Absolutely. And I agree with you that when I used it, I was it was very motivating. It really yeah. pushed me to train harder while I was playing with it. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And that can spark some interest into lifting and, you know, a little bit of a topic for another day, but some of the most successful athletes that I see, one of the traits I see in all of them is that they move the bar with great intention, no yep. matter what set it is. So their volume yep. sets and their heavy sets, they're moving with great speed and great intention and really good focus. And for some people, this can sort of bring that home to them and inspire them to lift like that. And then suddenly the results magnify, um, not because of, the load was exactly right, but now just because they're inspired to move so much harder and yes. um, with yeah, motor unit recruitment is going to mm-hmm. be higher when you move with so when you move with hard intention. And this was you know Louis had a good start with this with his dynamic effort training and his max effort effort training for West Side, but this mm-hmm. has made it so that you can accomplish both on the same day, which is what I love. Right, so he had a day where they would lift fifty percent, sixty percent, maybe seventy percent for speed which a lot of people now have said, like, I don't know how well it carries over all the time, right? Unless you're really hitting max force. Uh, but with this, you get to stay lifting heavy, like above that, whatever that intensity threshold is, it's going to drive strength gain. So at 80, 85%, whatever that is, you're able to stay in that zone and still move with intention and still move with speed. So you kind of kill two birds with one stone. One thing I'd love to play with, and I don't know if you played with this at all, is using the the rep one device to measure max force production on certain lifts. So um, I would argue, at least I have a theory and I haven't done this enough to know for sure, that if I were gonna be, if I were gonna deadlift, let's say a couple times a week, two, three times a week, and one of those times was gonna be for what would be more of a traditional West Side speed day. So they're gonna do, you know, let's say six doubles or five doubles or even seven singles or something. And it's going to be speed day. And normally that would be, again, in that 50 to 70% range. I would argue that I think it would carry over significantly better if you lifted for max force production. So force being this combination of speed and heavy. So you can lift really, really fast with really light weights, but that's not a lot of force because there's not a lot of weight. And you can lift really, really heavy weights, really, really slow, but there's still at some point there's a force degradation because it gets so much slower. Mm-hmm. Have you played at all with lifting whatever that percentage is? I don't even know where it would be, like probably maybe an 80, mid-80, low 80s, it would probably depend on the lift, where you would calculate the mass on the bar, the weight on the bar, the load on the bar, and the speed to get max force production, and then play around with where's my max force production and train at that spot and see what the carryover is like. Have you done anything like that? I did. So I, I was first introduced to this type of training six, seven, eight years ago now. So quite a while ago um, when these devices weren't even readily commercially available. And that was one of the first things I played with was actually measuring power, um, total power, total output. Um, yeah. And I don't want to misrepresent anything because it's been many years since I've looked at the data. I remember one of my takeaways was anything below 70% was less. 
less, yes. uh, measured less work. Um, but when you hit 70, uh, 70%, so it kind of increased linearly to about 70%, you were reaching close to peak forces and somewhere between 70, 85 forces stayed peaked. Um, and then there was a decline somewhere in the high percentiles. Okay, again. So there, and there you're is a about curve the, to it. There's a, that's the slow lifts, right? That's really the power lifts, right? Mm -hmm. And the other thing you mentioned is, and, and this is obviously the changes, the percentages dramatically is when you go to the actual power type movements, right? So to something like a snatch or a clean, my guess is those percentage would all shift up about 10%. So, right. So right. because a snatch or a clean is not really a max strength event, it's a max power event, right? It's how much power, how much can I produce? How much force can I produce quickly into the floor? Um, right. And so I, and I do know that Brian Mann at, at uh, university of Miami, when he was at Missouri, he, they did this with Tendo units. The, Tendos were yep. the earliest units. They were like two grand, 2,500 bucks. They're pretty that's expensive. That's the one I had. Yep. Yeah. And so, and they would do that. And that's what Louis had like three of them at West Side. And they, he started playing around with, they were doing power cleans, just actual power, like hanging power, hanging power cleans, as I think is what they were doing. And they would just move that hanging power clean. They would, they would calculate the weight. They would look at the speed and they would do that for max force. And he found that it carried over better to vertical jump mm. improvement, which again, we know we can't improve that much, right? 10, right. 12, maybe 15% for the outliers. Of course, you're all dealing with division one level players, so they're all outliers anyway. <laughs> but he found that it carried over better when they actually train their power clean, not to max he the heaviest power clean they could possibly do, but the one that produced the most force. And I, I know he, I'll get the numbers wrong. I know he had the data on that though too, and I know the percentage was probably higher than what it would be for the slow lift. So it's probably going to be closer to 88 as opposed to 78, right? Some, somewhere in there. So really interesting stuff to play around. With. So again, if you, if you like geeking out on this stuff, and the data that it spits out continues to get better. That's the other thing with these devices, Rep1 devices and others. And I, I will say as well that I, I have not found that there is a day coming when hardware is not going to be needed for this. Mm -hmm. But that day is not here, right? Yeah. I, I have yet to find, um, you know, Coach's Eye was kind of one of the first ones that started doing bar tracking. And again, we don't have any relationship with any of these companies. But right now, Nothing is nothing performs as accurately, not even close to as accurately as using these velocity devices to actually have the hardware where you actually have the wire that attaches to the barbell. So it actually knows exactly what your velocity is like there is there will be a day, I'm sure, where you'll be able to probably even maybe even take maybe the piece of maybe the hardware, the hardware is maybe literally a tiny node that you put at the end of your barbell, a little sticker thing that it picks up on and then it would probably work a lot better. Right now, it's not very good at just tracking the end of the barbell for velocity, bar speed, range of motion. That's the other thing that we haven't talked about either is this this movement or this uh, Rep1 device will measure range of motion. So you can actually measure work. I actually thought about having a contest with those of us that have it <laughs> and do something like, you know, I don't know, like a 225 bench or maybe even up to like a 300 bench or 315 bench for reps. So you know, I know like Carl Shute, who's who you've coached and who's one who's our head of head of coach. Like he's he, you know he's got short arms, short legs, mm -hmm. you know, short range of motion on everything. If we did, if we all did the same weight, so we all had to do let's say two twenty five bench press for reps, and you do it for as many reps as you can, and at the end it counts how much work you did, like how much range of motion that weight over this much range of motion over time, so yeah. that some guys might be able to do six reps with something else that a guy could might have to do for 11 and it's the same amount of work that could actually be a fun measure of uh data and prs as well that you can turn that into a kind of fun competition that would be fun uh okay last last one i think primarily is that do you use this velocity based stuff for accessory lifts at all and if so which ones or how do you approach accessory movements sure let's um I wouldn't exactly call them accessories, but you brought up the snatch and the clean and jerk and high pulls and these kind of things. I have used them for that. Um, mostly, I don't track the me uh, the um, average velocity any longer. I, I would track the peak, peak. velocity because yep. that's really the only important metric in a clean. It doesn't really matter how fast it averagely moves from one yeah. position to the other. It don't matters care how fast, how fast it comes off the floor. Yeah. It's it how just fast has to it... accelerate at the top right, right before that's you right. go to the catch, right? So I will, I'll use it on, on those lifts. And then 
I have not used it a significant amount on many accessory lifts. Um, one is their degree of importance in which they play in our program where the primary barbell movements are the highest. Um, and then they, the accuracy could be called into question. It depends on the movement itself. So, you know, what's the, what's the path like, like a curl, it doesn't have a vertical bar path, right? So how would that affect the numbers? It'd be yep. interesting to know, especially with like the new 3D sensor that the Rep1 has and whether, whether that could um, figure that out or not. But yeah. various different accessories may not have vertical bar paths and maybe are more power oriented than static. And there's a lot of a lot of things that go into it. Have you, have you ever tried it with any of the accessory lifts or can you think of any that it might be useful for? I haven't. Um, and not that many. I mean, you know, again, I think the closer it looks to a main lift. So the closer it looks like a supplemental movement or is a supplemental movement. I think it would work better. I think you could use it for barbell rows, especially something like a pen lay row where we tend to pull those relatively explosively off the floor. Right. Um, I, you know, think, thinking about trying to use it, I, I think you are putting yourself on some level of probably, and I don't know this, I'm just guessing, an increased risk for injury. Like if I were going to use it on like a chin up, let's say, right? Like especially a weighted chin up. The combination of hanging a weight from my waist and pulling as fast as I can to get my head over, over the bar feels like a bicep strain waiting right. to happen for me. Um, and so I I think I would be careful. Then the other thing is, is for those who have used this, if you're listening to this and you've actually used these devices, and I realize most of you haven't, it's some additional work to set up. And there is some additional time or certainly some attention between the sets. And and so it just by nature of curiosity, even like I, I, I'm watching my velocity on every warm up set of squats or every warm up set of deadlifts. Um, the deadlift, by the way, is the one that to me is the least accurate because it'll bounce sometimes when you set the bar on the ground, right? So you sit on the ground, it kind of does a little bounce and then it like measures two reps and you have to figure out which one was the real rep and which one do I throw away? And so you, you get a little bit of that. And so sometimes there's a, you know, it, it doesn't always work perfectly. They work really well and they're really interesting to use, but your, your attention is really on like you lift and you immediately get done with the lift. And I look at the device, at least that's what I do because I'm interested in it. And then I lift and I look at the device and I'm like, what's my, I don't want to do that for my curls and my dips and my rolling dumbbell extensions and things like that. And I just, like you said, the nature of the fact that a lot of those accessory movements are not vertical bar paths. And so therefore, um, anatomy, ch anthropometric changes would make a big difference. You think about something like a curl or a rolling dumbbell extension, which are basically the same movements but antagonists of each other. The, the length of your humerus to your forearm would change dramatically the speed of the lift. And so, you know, then it becomes, it would become difficult to kind of figure out what's going on there. So yeah, I, I don't see a lot of carry over there. I do for sure for things like power clean snatches, peak velocity, like you talked about, even maybe peak velocity for something like a, anything that's explosive. Sure. Um, I think it could be used for any of the major supplemental movements. I haven't used it for yep. something like a rack pull. I think it would work well for a rack pull. Mm -hmm. I think it would work well for a deficit deadlift, you know, things like this, I think would, do, would do great. The front squad. For us, but even something like uh, a slingshot bench press, I think sure. would, would work. You could put a slingshot and, and you could see it would actually be really interesting to do a full a bench press, like a whatever, a, whatever you bench press at 275 and you do it without the slingshot. Then you put the slingshot on. You see how much the velocity changes with adding that. So, you know, there's lots of fun you could have with it. But I think also you could take it too far. And so we want to use yep. it, like you said, with intention. It gives you some novelty. It get, it makes it exciting. It makes it motivating. And most importantly, it really helps hone in on on the correct stress from an auto regulation standpoint in a way that we haven't been able to do in the past, which is it removes the subjectiveness of it all and really gives you a much better objective um, input. And that's what we're trying to do with this with these devices. Cool. Any other comments on this stuff? Um, you brought up some, you know, in the future, we may not need devices, um, yeah. they're the same devices. And I do, I am watching out for things that are coming up and some things are being brought to my attention. So again, we're not associated with these companies, but metric VBT is using iPhones in a way to track with very specific parameters about where you set your iPhone. Yeah, okay. Um, and at least their first study they put out is reasonably accurate or re reasonably comparative to the tether devices and then a nice. new one hit the market that has it actually attaches to both ends of the barbell and uses a lidar technology to triangulate position oh and wow that one was coming out with accuracy and you feel from the back or the front the or um, the one that uses the just the camera films from a very specific distance looking at the place okay got it 
Got it. Yeah. And then the one that's actually tethered, then the you said that it actually tethers to both sides of the plates. It's it's uh, like a lidar technology, so it actually it's attached and then remotely sends it to a unit separate from it. Got it. Okay. So okay. nothing's Makes tied sense. to the barbell. Okay. Okay. But okay. one of Got the it. interest, you know, one of the interesting things for me was the video one was claiming that you know the thing like you said on the deadlift, the bounce, right, yep. can affect the tethered units, um, but perhaps units that measure just video and this as they get really good may actually be more accurate and may be able to sure. have sort of ai type stuff analyzing that data and getting really accurate data so could be cool stuff on the future i'm going to keep my eye on it for sure as this becomes more accessible because everybody's got an iphone right and if right. you didn't have to buy one of these units awesome like now everybody can have access to this that the wants cameras this. are so amazing and you know it's, it's for years right we had one camera on the back and then we had two and now we have three yeah. <laughs> so the, the fact that it reads depth of field means it's just a matter of time before it's able to do this really well, but not yet. Yeah. And for now, again, for basically what the cost of a barbell is, you can get one of these things. So mm -hmm. as you're as you're trying to introduce some amount of novelty or change things up a little bit, I think this is a great a great move to make for those of you who are, are relatively advanced lifters or moving that direction. It's also really fun as a coach to be able to collect that data and play with the data and look what the fall off is. You know, the other thing we didn't talk a lot about, but the, I, I can see I have certain clients who their their fall off or their degradation in, in velocity is significantly higher than others. And so they can move rep one at this, which is really the primary rep we measure. But then if it's if I'm giving them sets of five, there's a lot of fall off by set by rep five. I have others that have almost no fall off by rep five, which is really interesting. Like they're able to maintain very high rate of force production, even under fatigue, which I would guess is also something that's never really been studied, but has to be a a clear value of athletic ability, much like a vertical jump would be, right? So mm -hmm. I can remember when when I was when I was competing in strongman and won my pro card, the ability to flip a heavy, super heavy, I mean a heavy tire, like an eleven hundred pound tire, not on the first rep, but on like the twelfth <laughs> rep. That was really what separated the best pros from everybody else. They were still able to figure out under fatigue how to get their body ready and boom, explode. And I think there's some usefulness here in these devices as well. We're yeah, I love it because we're just really on the early horizons of like, mm -hmm. you know, the cutting edge of this thing. There's so many things that are gonna come from this over time. And like we said, eventually the hardware is gonna go away and you're just the hardware is gonna be the phone itself. Uh, but if you're into that sort of thing, I've got some clients I can think of right now who just, they just always want to buy the newest gadget. And a lot of those guys are already in the spot where they're able to use something like this. So it's a pretty good, pretty good place to go. And you'll learn something about your training regardless. So it's, it's a pretty good move to make. Cool. That is another episode of the Barbell Logic Podcast. Thank you so much for being part of the auto regulatory, uh, series that we, that we've done. Again, this, these velocity devices are not the only way to auto regulate. There are other ways. And I think there's value in those, even when they're subjective. So there are reasons to do RPE reps and reserves, certainly as communication tools, looking at things like AMRAPs, making adjustments, top set, hit a top set for so many reps, do back offs. All of those are auto regulation. So we can auto regulate from session to session, not just with a velocity meter, but with these velocity devices, it, it makes it so much easier, so much more objective, so much more accurate. And that's been our experience. I think at this point, we've got maybe 12 or 14 across our, our clients. So it's not like we're using it. We're not using it with 50. And we've got, I think, four or five coaches. And then each of us have three, four clients that have done this. So maybe, maybe we have closer to 20, 25 at this point. Uh, but it's a great place to go. So if you are a client of Barbell Logic and you want to do this, reach out to your coach and ask about it. If you're not a client of Barbell Logic, we'd love for you to be. Remember, your first month is always free. We have huge holiday Black Friday sales coming up. We don't do that. You know, we don't do sales anymore. Have you noticed this? I have noticed this. Yes. But I think we've got some, we've got some big sales coming up around. Excellent. The week, the week before Thanksgiving, because I want to do it before the noise gets crazy. Oh yeah. You ever the notice that Thanksgiving? Year? <laughs> it just will. And even just, but they sell stuff between Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and Christmas. Oh yeah. For you sure. You know, like, so you eat that turkey and you eat those mashed potatoes and you're sitting on the couch and you pull up Instagram <laughs> and it's like 90% ads. Mm -hmm. I like to come in a week before that. So that's what we're going to do. So keep watching. Like that's a little teaser. Thank you, Jordan. By the way, congrats on your new gym. You've got a second, you're the owner of two gyms now out in Portland. Yes, Sucks sir. You're in the worst city in the United States, but <laughs> two of the best gyms in the world in the worst city in the United States. They balance each other out. No, I'm just busting your balls. How how are the new gyms going to strength union? Right. 
Yes, sir. Strength Union, uh, Southeast Portland. It's going fantastic. Big changeover, new equipment. People are loving it. I'm super excited, and I, I love the new group, and it feels great. I love it. I'll give you another little teaser. I think uh, we are one of the things we're going to talk about around the holidays and that we're going to hold in early January is a, a business of coaching webinar that we'd like to have you a uh, part of that I'm going to be on. We'd like to have you, if you say yes, CJ, the head of our academy, and we're going to talk about things like both how to be um, how to be better business people and better coaches, both from an effectiveness standpoint, an efficiency standpoint, a profitability standpoint, both for in-person and online coaching. You are our in-person expert. Uh, I can talk a lot about the online. We'll talk about all those things. And so keep watch for that, that future business of coaching webinar coming up. We'll start selling that around Thanksgiving and uh, we'll hold that right after the first of the year. So keep your eyes peeled. My marketing team's going to be pissed off that I even said it, but they don't <laughs> listen to the podcast, so it's fine. So <laughs> if you have any questions, feel free to reach out at the podcast at barbelllogic.com and we will see you guys next week.